dancing with, you know, weddings and, and different clients. But, you know, having that one retainer client allowed me to go full time. Well, that's that's mm -hmm. really nice. They're able to finally go full time and have that retainer, you know, in place so that you felt comfortable to do it. I'm just, I have the chat like off in the corner here and I want to talk more about that, but I just realized I should address, I guess people couldn't hear my audio. So sorry. Can you hear me now? Hopefully you can. Uh, I'm just getting everything set up. So hopefully that's popping in now. Let me know in the chat if you can hear me. I see. I didn't, I didn't have it added. I had Marcos, but I didn't have my audio on. We hear you. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. So uh, like I said, first time bringing in Skype in on this computer. So getting it figured out still. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the first, first minute people couldn't hear me, but they heard you. So that's great. Uh, yeah. So yeah, okay. you went, you started freelancing in 2019, the beginning of 2019, right? You said, so it's been almost, I mean, it'll be two years at, at the end of this year, pretty much. Right. 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 That's a good amount of time. It's, yeah. I mean, like, like, I don't know if people, they hear that, uh, I had this retainer client were they able to hear me, but not you? Yes. Yeah. They could hear you. <laughs> okay, okay. They could hear everything you said, but I didn't have my mic turned All on. Right. So I was just sitting there well, talking. <laughs> yeah. Retainer clients are great. Uh, you know, after the first year I realized that that retainer client was going to go away. But luckily I had already branched out to different clients and I, and all this time I knew that that could happen, right? That I could lose this retainer client. But luckily I had built enough uh, volume of uh, contacts and referrals and that even when I lost them, I was able to keep continue my, my full-time freelance, you know, I make a full-time living. And over the years, it's just be become more consistent, you know, when, when you when I first got started, uh, with freelance, it was just here and there. That's why I had to keep a day job. Uh, you know, so it's slowly that like the income has increased and I've, you know, been able to charge more, but also, uh, not stress as much because freelance could be pretty stressful when you're just getting started or when you don't have uh, plenty of clients, you don't know how much you're going to make that month. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it is still like that. It's, it's, it's a roller coaster, right? Like yeah. the past two weeks I had back to back shoots and now this week I have no scheduled shoots because two shoots that I had scheduled, they rescheduled, which, which, you know, you kind of have to look out, you know, uh, be aware of the waves in freelance, mm -hmm. uh, work comes, people reschedule and there, and then everyone wants to shoot at the same time. So you know, uh, you, you do your best to manage all these relationships. Yeah. Well, it sounds like things have been working out for you. Like even with all of the, you know, losing your, you know, your big retainer client, that sounds like that was your leap, like your jumping off point. You were ready to quit your full-time, you know, day job with that retainer. Even with losing it, you had already built up a really good uh, amount of clientele there and you just keep networking and, and keep it kind of flowing in. So that is a little bit scary. I mean, for me, uh, for those of you in the video that don't know, I work full time at a video production company here in Phoenix. And, you know, we do commercials, ads, live streams, all that kind of stuff, corporate work, pretty similar to what Marcos does, but I just work in house at a studio doing it there. Um, you know, I haven't taken that leap yet to go full time freelance. Um, you know, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit scary, a little bit of unknown. Like you said, like you don't always know where the next job yeah. might be coming from. Um, yeah. And, and I, I mean, I, I wanted to, like, I, I, I applied for a couple of video production companies when I was starting out. And I, I mean, I, I suggested to most people, like, that's the best way to do it because you get training, like repeated training all the time, you know, yeah. and you get paid, you get paid for it. You get paid for your training. Yeah. When you, you when you're freelancing, you kind of have to create your own work, you know, and, and like the majority of the time you're just looking for work. That That's your job looking for work. Even now, the, the majority of my time is just spent uh, following up or like, who can I reach out to? Who haven't I talked to? Who? Uh, who, who owes yeah. me money? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel so, like that's half the work is like the half have the work of freelance it. is hunting down the, the paycheck, like hunting invoices. Down. Yeah. Yeah. You, you haven't paid me. What's up? And so, you know, luckily the, I, I've, uh, 
I've, I've uh, tailored, uh, well, I've directed my, uh, my freelance towards corporate and commercial. So most corporate clients that I have now, they're pretty good. But, yeah. you know, I, I did that intentionally. I didn't want to work with small businesses. Uh, you know, when, when you're charging the, the owner of that business, every transaction, it, it's more, uh, it's more, it, 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 they can feel it, right? It's like, yes. it's coming out of their pocket mm -hmm. as opposed to working with uh, corporate clients. It's a marketing manager or whoever, and they're, it's not their money. So they're like, yeah, I have a budget here it is. And so, yes. you know, it's e easier to get their money. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I 100% agree yeah. with that. And I bet uh, I bet other people down in the chat feel the same way. Let it let us know if you guys have experienced that. Like when you are doing jobs for those big corporations, they have much larger marketing budgets. And like you said, it's not their money. That's their job is to spend the money on marketing and they know what they can spend. But when you're doing it for like a mom, pa shop, a restaurant in downtown or something, a lot of times it's coming out of their own, you know, payment and they're they're not willing to spend as much. So it's nice to get in with those corporations, even if they're smaller ones, if they are a small franchise or whatever, they always have a much larger budget. So definitely. Agree. Yeah. You see, uh, Jeremy's asking, how did uh, COVID affect the work? And obviously for a couple first couple months, it was just everything, there was no work. But I, I guess one, one good thing about uh, uh, myself as a freelancer, I'm very disciplined because I know that I have these roller coasters, so I'm pretty good with saving money. That's so that's cool. another thing you learn as a freelancer. You, you're kind of always prepared for uh, the famine, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I felt like I was pretty prepared for it, but it did pick up, you know, later on it picked up like there's a lot of work, a lot of uh, money that needed to be spent before the year's over. <laughs> yeah, we. See. And I, yeah, you, you know about that. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to catch you off there. Yeah, we had a similar experience like that. Like it was pretty scary at the beginning. We we lost a lot of our clients. Like just they didn't want to make anything. Everyone was kind of scared. We didn't know what was going on, oh. um, and they were scared to spend any money on marketing because it was like we all didn't know if the economy was going to crash or what was going to happen. Oh. So a lot of them kind of dried up, but then we had some consistent ones that went really hard and started doing just live streaming almost, you know, weekly or every day. Some of them clients that were just putting out live streams all the time. We were doing, we were filming a podcast and stuff. So a video podcast. So there were certain things that kept us afloat through all that. And obviously there were no events. We had like five or six events scheduled for the rest of the year and not one of them happened. They all canceled. Um, some of them did end up going like virtual only. I know we were talking about this a little bit before, but you know, how's that been for you with, you know, with that, you know, with the change, the way the world's been, have you been doing virtual production, putting on live streams for other companies or people? Um, has that been something yeah. you've had to add to your, uh, ensemble, I guess? Uh, here and there, I mean, um, you know, one, one, also one of the things that, uh, for me, my business changed, uh, like or uh, like late 2019. Well, even since then, uh, the weddings, live events have like live events have never been like my main uh, business. Basically, yeah. I, 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 I like weddings. I kind of moved away, so I know yeah. I have a a lot of buddies that just did primarily weddings, and they got hit really hard. Yes. Uh, because the work did not come back. Uh, October, September, October, November, where where it did for me because. Uh, companies needed to advertise or whatever they were doing, promoting stuff. Uh, now, with live streamings, the only thing that's changed for me is uh, like directors who can't fly in and I have to show them my camera. I'm hired as a DP. I have to show them my camera angles mm. through uh, Zoom. Oh, interesting. And so that's that's the only thing I've been uh, like they've been requesting. And you know, like the crews got smaller, you know, mm -hmm. the like now I'm expected to uh, uh, run sound and, and like handle everything with just my, myself or just a second person. Uh, because that's another thing that I've been getting into is working with bigger crews, uh, you know, and, and sometimes I'm, I'm putting together a team like, let's say, a, a gaffer or um uh, camera assistant, if we're running two cameras and, and a sound person, uh, sound person, you, you know, and it, it might scale a little bit bigger. Yeah. Uh, but during the, the pandemic, everything got shrunken down to just myself and maybe, a 
a camera assistant. That was it. Like we're doing everything. And, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I did do a couple of live streams, but it wasn't, I would, I wouldn't say it was just, uh, yeah, I was surprised I didn't get more, you yeah. know, inquiries for that. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I think, uh, that's really cool though. Like, uh, you know, zooming in the, the different uh, directors and things they could see your image live. I imagine you're using like, you know, a wireless transmit or something and just putting an HDMI input in and that sort of thing mm -hmm. into a computer. I imagine is that kind of a similar setup. Or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the camera we're using, but most of the time it's just, uh, like, uh, I have the right now, like the, what is it? The A10 Mini, the mm -hmm. Blackmagic A10 Mini Pro. Yeah, that's. What and I, I would uh, pipe in the cameras that way, and then I show them like both camera angles or three. We'd, we've even done three cameras, and um, yeah, and they could hear the whole thing the whole time because we we're also getting the, the audio the the, uh, f you know, into the camera that way they can hear it, yeah. and, and so they they're able to direct us remotely through Zoom. So. That's cool. I mean, yeah. yeah. Interesting. I I saw. Um, I don't know if you subscribe to the ASC magazine, the Amer uh, American Cinematographer magazine, um, but it's it's a really cool magazine. You should check it out if not. But it uh, they were talking about that and that actually a lot of like the big um, DPs and like shooting like films and television shows were actually talking about that how people would join in on Zoom remotely and and watch the dailies and things like that, watch the filming. So uh, that's kind of cool that you're, you know, you're doing the same thing that uh, some of those guys are doing. Well, let me check out the chat here for a sec. Uh, let's definitely address that. I want to make sure seeing, uh, seeing what everyone's talking about. Uh, say hello to a couple people. We talked about Jeremy, how you doing? Andre Gittins, Dusty Krusty, what's up? Um, <laughs> schedule admin. Let's see. Diego Sahugan. Everyone's saying no audio at the beginning. Again, sorry about that, guys. It's going to be an awkward, like, first two minutes. Um, let's see. Brian Barajas. I can never, like, pronounce anyone's usernames, but what's up? Uh, Scott's Slasher World says corporate gigs are the best. Yeah, definitely agree with that. They, uh, sometimes they have, like, the most critique on the videos. I feel like sometimes they have the most, like, little bits of edits, but they usually, uh, yeah, they definitely pay the best and, and the easiest. Um Dusty Krusty says, who helped you get to this point in your career? So, yeah, I'll ask that to you, Marcos. How, how'd you get where you are today and everything like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot, I think it's just uh, getting to know a bunch of people. So it's not one person, right? For me, it was getting to know anyone who did video in my local area. So for, for, for in my local area, it was, all, it was mostly wedding videographers, and that's how I got started. And that's how I first got my first paying gig was through uh, weddings, right? And so I, I emailed everybody, hey, do you need somebody, right? So it's, don't rely on one source uh, if you're freelancing, right? Uh, you have to you know, spread your wings and, and, and reach and try to reach as many people. And I think the fastest way to do that is to reach uh, or to reach out to people that are doing video. They always need help or they might be open. They've never thought about it. But, you know, you might be the right person if you have the right attitude and the right drive. Um, I, I found that emailing businesses like cold calling, that that is really hard. You know, <laughs> most businesses are, are not open to that. No. Uh, so, you know, the a lot of times is, is just uh, looking at job boards or uh, just word of mouth. If somebody, you know, a, a buddy of you or yours or family, hey, I have a business. And so you need to get the the word of, of mouth going. That takes a long time. It's just a lot of consistency. Maybe, you know, I don't know if there's any clubs or organizations, you know, you just basically have to try everything and don't be afraid to, you know, go to dead ends you know you thought this was going to work out and it doesn't work out but you learn something from that uh, i guess it just comes down to the being very proactive super proactive you know yeah uh, i know i know we're out we're all creatives we want to live in that world but as a freelancer you got to put on the business hat and, and go all in on that and I, I i resented that for the longest time because i didn't want to i just wanted to get paid to do my creative work 
and to you know i thought if i get really good at what i do so that's where i you know at the beginning I, that's where i put all my focus just on uh, you know learning the filmmaking part but that didn't get me work it was the networking that got me the work yeah and and obviously if you want to work on bigger stuff you kind of have to like uh, you know you know get, get get around people that are willing to spend <laughs> so you have to develop the your business savviness you know yeah absolutely I, I definitely agree with that i think uh a lot of us you know get in that that mindset like being creative that we just want to we just want to do our job like show up shoot the video edit it and everything but the business side can be a struggle um mm -hmm. i have a I have a slight advantage there because I went to school for business. That was my major. So I already kind of knew oh. going into it that like, that's what I was going to focus on. Um, but so it's been a little bit, of, a little bit of a help, but yeah, I definitely uh, agree with, agree with what you're saying there. Um, and it's, it's all about, you know, like you said, like, how, you know, how did you get started networking all the people you learn along the way? And then I think as well as like, I don't know if this has been the same for you, but for learning the craft, like learning videography, Mine has, of course, been from people like on shoots, learning how they do it, how they like, like their techniques and also like YouTube. I don't know if the same for you, but I've learned a ton oh, yeah. from watching YouTube videos um, and like courses and things like that, like Shane Hurlbut and like other people I've put out, like watching their really like super helpful, helpful content. So it's not unattainable. Mm -hmm. I think anyone watching this today could be doing what we're doing or, or much better. You know, they can definitely oh, yeah. accomplish that. Um, let's see. And, and mall Sony, what's up? Says how, how convince any clients with whom you are desperate to work with, but his budget is not enough. By the way, I love your videos. Thanks. Um, oh. how do you convince a client to work with you, but their budget, their budget isn't enough. That's a little bit of an oxymoron. Cause I think if their budget isn't enough, like you would work with them if you really wanted to work with them. I'm not sure. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's like, Oh no, the, they, as she says, she's uh, I, I believe it's a, she, or is it a, a he, no, it's a he animal. Uh, I think he, uh, animal saying that he, he's, de uh, he's desperate to work with this client, but they don't have the budget. Mm. Mm. Like they don't have a budget to work with him at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, you can do it for cheap. That, that's the problem is like, if you really want to work with that client and put them on your resume, like put them on your website, put that like brand name or whatever it is up or add them to your reel, I guess you just got to do it for cheap. You know, if that, if the, if the client doesn't have the, the budget, I don't know if you really want to add them to like your trophy wall of done videos. So, I mean, right. I, let's chat about that for a sec. Like, how do you feel about free work? How long did you do? Do free work or did you do any free work getting yeah. started that sort of stuff what are your thoughts on i mean that? that's a constant struggle i know for me the like the first clients i ever had it, 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 i had like the worst clients up front I, <laughs> like yeah. the 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 cheapest clients were up front because they know that you're insecure you're not sure of yourself you haven't developed your you know your workflow that's part of it understanding the the dance that you're doing to onboard this client and to take them from beginning to end, you know, and sometimes you don't have a, a workflow. You don't understand the dance that it takes to go from onboarding the client. Oh, here's here's script writing and this is how we're going to do the video and then this is how we're going to edit. And so you haven't developed that. So you yourself are not, uh, what do you call it, uh, the best uh, filmmaker yet, you know, that yes. you could be. You're still developing. Because you know, we all like to complain, oh, cheap clients, cheap clients. But in the beginning, you yourself are not, you know, you're not there. So you, it's really hard for you to, to pull off a, you know, an ollie, <laughs> yeah. you know, talking about skateboarding. And, uh, you know, the, I think nowadays it, the I, I rarely take on uh, clients that don't have money because it's quickly I'm able to they quickly can tell that I, I am not there anymore. Like I'm not beginning. They, they, they I feel like they, they, they can sense that I, I, I'm busy and I, I, I'm doing uh, bigger projects. Maybe, I don't know. They, 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 I scare them away fast or I can sense that they are not willing to spend. So it's not worth my time. 
And, yeah. and so I guess you, you got to be willing to go through that motion of, yeah, I'm going to charge cheap, but I'm going to learn what it takes to go through the, you know, work with the client and next time I'm going to do it better. Yeah. And so you got to forgive yourself for the, you know, the, those times where you end up doing cheap work or even if you do it for free, just be aware that, you know, you, you're, you, you got to take something away from it, right? If you already have a body of work and you're doing amazing stuff, then maybe it's because you just want to do something really creative or there's got to be some something of value to you. It just can't be all them, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think I think starting out doing work for free is is a huge part of like growing your skills, getting something out of it for yourself. It might be a project that you're not getting paid a lot for or even paid at all, but you know that you're going to get something awesome for your reel or some really great experience. I definitely, uh, definitely know exactly what you're talking about there. Um, mm -hmm. let's see, I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat. Cause I know we're, we're talking is, here. uh, Jeremy, What's he you saying? see that Jeremy has another question. What, what ratio do you see you using your own gear, renting, hiring gear for a shoot? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I guess yeah. I'll, I'll go. I have a quick answer to that. For the most part, I use almost all my own gear. I don't rent very often, depending on the project. Like I've rented anamorphic lenses before because the project could afford it. And that was really just like fun and like really a cool <laughs> look at the Atlas anamorphics. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, like I'm an owner operator. And I think you're the same way with most of the stuff. But I've seen some pictures that look like maybe you're using other cameras. I'm not sure. But what, what's that like for you with renting versus like bringing cameras you own? Yeah. Well, hold on. Uh, so you also have a, you work at a video production company. Uh, do you, there's a video company own all the gear? Most of uh, they're most not. Most of the gear. Most of the gear. Yeah. We own like eight cameras or something like that. And almost, yeah. and we pretty much, so we, it's like the Sony, like four Sony FS5s, the Sony FS7, FS700, couple of the Sony Alphas. Um, those okay. are the primary, like primarily what we use, but sometimes we have rented reds before, like a package of three reds. That was fun. Um, but typically yeah. we like bring the, our own Sony cine cams or whatever for the most part, sometimes I sure, rent, but not, not very frequently. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm of the mindset that, uh, I, I want to own the gear because I want to be really good with, uh, become really experienced with it. Like. When, when I was trying to book a bigger clients and, and they were asking for the FS7, Sony FS7. Mm -hmm. And I could have lied and say, yeah, I have experience. But <laughs> I, 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 I would, you know, I, for me, I was making the jump from shooting with mirrorless cameras like the A7S2 to an FS7. To me, that that was scary if I've never touched this camera. So yeah. I ended up I ended up buying it just because it was a highly requested camera. And it still is, right? Yeah. No. Yeah, it's still high, highly requested for documentaries. And so I ended up buying it because I wanted to become really experienced with it and, and grow comfortable and know it inside and out. So that's why I bought it. And I felt like that's my way of getting my practice in. I, I, I didn't want to lie about um, my experience with it. So, yeah. yeah. So nowadays, uh, I mean, I, I, I own most of my gear. Like when uh, companies... Uh, uh, want to do a production. I, I have my own grip van and I rent that out oh, with cool. all, all the C stands and, uh, the lighting package, uh, you know, and the cameras because I'm shooting with the Ursa G2 and I sold the FS7. I bought the Ursa G2 and then I have this black magic pocket 4k that I'm shooting in right now. Um, I also have, yeah, I also have the, the red Komodo and be because, uh, for some productions are asking for the red and I am able to rent that out. And, and it's also like, I've seen that if you own a camera and you let it know into your, to your community of filmmakers, they're probably like, they'll think of you, they'll hire you because, Oh, you already have it. It's easier for them to hire you as opposed to even if you have it, if I have experience with red, but I don't own it, they might just, get someone else to go on that shoot, it, you know, because the, the, it's just, I don't know. You, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, like yeah. I got hired recently by a DP to, 
to do a second camera op for a commercial because he has he is an owner operator of the Red Gemini and he needed a second camera and I have the Red Komodo so he he recommended me to the agency and I got brought on for that and and, and so that's happened a couple of times because I am the I'm a, a owner operator mm -hmm. and it's easier right they they don't have to go pick up from the rental house a a uh, another camera body because that's a pain in the butt you know and yeah. then having to re you know, I'm taking care of everything, you know, like I, I, it, it, I bring it with me. It's already it has all the bells and whistles and I know how it works. And at the end of the day, I pack it up and I go, they, they don't have to take care of any of that. So it's convenience to some of my clients, you know, they, they, they if they're looking for a small production crew, the fact that I offer these things, is just, it's just a uh, easier transaction for them. It's, they don't have to go get a grip van, you know? and rent it out so yeah that's cool i didn't know you had a whole van grip van that's sick that's one of my yeah that sure. that happened that happened at the beginning of the year uh actually i i was uh visiting family in arizona in phoenix oh, really? and uh there's this guy is that uh, i went to scottsdale and bought it from this guy that's sick <laughs> like th the last day before i uh i drove back to california so that's i funny. drove back <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you were in my uh, you were in my backyard pretty much. I'm pretty close to Scott, so that's funny. So, yeah, dang, well that's sick, sick. You got the truck and that may or the the production van, and it makes a lot of sense, you know, to to already own the camera. It's you've put it out on social media. You have the red Komodo, um, you know, you have the Ursa G2, the Black Magic, so you can come in as you know easily as a second camera to match whatever other camera they might already have or you know a camera if they want to shoot on red or or so whatever it is so i think that's really cool and makes it worth getting the camera because yeah i mean it's an interesting dynamic when a lot of people are like hey do you just rent like you don't want to buy that cinema camera well if you already own it it makes you a little bit more marketable easier to get jobs because they know hey that guy has a red and we want to shoot on a red or whatever they don't have to spend the money on the insurance yeah. and the rental package and all that exactly and find someone that knows how to operate it and it's like you already know how you're comfortable with it like it's a good package deal like to bring in the camera and you like your ex expertise yeah i mean you know people say well gear doesn't matter and red is overrated yeah, I, I mean, I get all those arguments, but the red aura is there. Yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> People are like, okay, you have a red, you must be your expert. You must be a, you know, well, it has this aura, like it makes you, uh, <laughs> you know, in, in some people's eyes, like, oh my God, this guy's at another level, right? As opposed to mm -hmm. if you're shooting in with smaller camera bodies, you know, they, so. Yeah. I, I guess, you know, it's silly, but it's true. Yeah. You know, that's why I moved away. I mean, I could be shooting it with smaller camera bodies. It would make my job much easier. I could move faster, pack less gear, you know, make my life so much easier. But it, that's part of the reason I have the Ursa G2 is because I'm hired also on documentaries and they they want all these bells and whistles on the camera they want to record audio internally they want uh time code mm -hmm. uh and it just looks like you can beef up the black magic pocket 4k or the 6k but it just, you know some productions are like yeah i don't know about that you know it's not real a real yeah. cinema camera or yeah. it's a, a real eng camera yeah you know, so they they're like they might be hesitant. They they might not see you with the same perception of your expertise level. Yeah. So that's where I see valuable. That's where I noticed that I needed to own this gear to at least give me that aura. Yes, totally. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like I don't want that to be a a restriction to hire me just because I don't have the right camera body. You know. Like the, the FS7, I, you know, when they asked me, do you have that camera? I'm like, nope, but I have years of experience and I can rent it out in a heartbeat, you know? Yeah. And, and so, you know, yeah, get, get your, if you haven't touched these cameras, I, I think it's really good to get yourself around them and uh, working for a video production company is the best way to do it if you can't afford them. But yeah. Find a way to get experience with those cameras. It's just going to make you more valuable. Yeah, definitely. I think that's really cool. And I think, I think you've taken a good approach with it being like a trying to be just sounds like, you know, if you could 
it sounds like you'd probably just want a DP if you could. And it sounds like you're like taking a good approach towards that being like, okay, I'm going to own these cameras and just hire me as a DP. I'll bring my camera and I'll do my job. Is, is that accurate? Mm, yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely I, I, that was very intentional before, uh, I was doing the full production, basically the, you know, writing this or helping with the client, write the script. And yeah. this is, we're making this type of video. And I was doing the pre-production production and the post-production. Mm -hmm. Now it's a slowly, I'm just doing DP and that's it. Like I don't, after I'm done with the shoe, like that's it. Like it goes off to an editor or the client takes the footage from me and that's it. I, I, I don't revisit that, that video after that, you know, and I'm also not part of the pre-production trying to write out the perfect script, you know, and, and, and that was intentional. I, I, I took on a big commercial project like a year and a half ago. It was very stressful because yeah. it was, I had to hire a bunch of actors. I, I, I took on the production with the buddy of mine and, and, uh, those are stressful when, when you're hiring actors and people to show up and, the actors are not delivering their lines that happened on this. And, uh, and after that, I'm like, I'm never producing a video ever again yeah. because if, if the, if, if those mistakes happen, it falls on the producer director. I was producing, directing and DP. <laughs> yeah. The whole everything. Yeah. And so pr producing is stressful. I mean, I, I just did a, a commercial, uh, like a little corporate commercial thing. It's very small, uh, but the director was stressing out the whole time because they were also producing. Uh, it, it was just there was too many moving parts, you know, and and those jobs are very stressful. I, I just I'm not wired for them, yeah. And I and I and I learned that about myself. So, you know, I am trying to finally specialize in just DP. Don't I'm not an editor. When I, when they email me, hey, can you edit this? I'm like, I don't edit. Sorry, <laughs> I, I don't. So finally, I, slowly, I, I've gotten a little bit more selective. That's nice. Uh, That's you know, nice to sometimes, be able to have sometimes, that option. yeah. I mean, sometimes I go back on my word when things are slow, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, I, I do try to stick to just my the camera department. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I think that's, I think that's the right, uh, the right path for you. If that's what you want to do, you just stay true to that and you'll just keep mm -hmm. getting hired more and more as a DP and you don't have to focus on the stuff you don't want to do, the producing, the pre-production, the editing. Cause yeah, I totally know how that is. There's been projects just like that where I've had to hire five, 10 people, organize it all, get everyone together, get the locations, like everything. And it's just like, it's very stressful and they can be huge projects. So it's really nice to just show up, film, light, do all that, and then like walk away and be like, my job's done. Edit it. I'll watch the final video or whatever. Uh, That's nice. Right, right. And, and uh, you know, uh, referring back to another issue I did recently, the, the, the producer director was there and one of the talent was, well, they were just like a, a person at this company that was supposed to read a script, right, uh, from a teleprompter. Yeah. And, and they could not like get the words out. They just weren't good. Right. They, it was just, this, this, this guy's a farmer, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's uh, a huge farmer here in, uh, in the, in the uh, Monterey Bay area, but uh, he just couldn't get the words, words out. And, and he's like, I can't do this. He was late like two hours and he can't do it. He was so nervous. He was sweating. We're in the middle of the farms. And, and so the, I was looking at the producer. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm thank I'm thankful I'm not that guy because they finally said, Oh, we're gonna have to come back another day. Marcos, are you available? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, who's paying for this? I mean, yeah. like that's not yeah. that's not my problem. <laughs> like nope. you, if you want me to come back again, you, you know. Yeah. But the producer might have to the producer, on the other hand, might already have budgeted like this is the project we're gonna charge you. And then the, the, the talent fails to perform and then they have to go back to, Oh man, I don't want to deal with that. So yeah, yeah that sounds, <laughs> that sounds like a nightmare. I mean, that's like, I think that answers Scott slasher world's question about what's the worst gig you ever had. I mean, I don't know if that's the worst, but that sounds like one of the worst for sure for you. So. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I guess the worst gigs are, uh, for me are when I've had to take on these all the all these roles right and and mm -hmm. like that 
you know, the, the, the commercial I was referring to, the, the actor that I hired was failing to deliver the lines. They, they, they were getting so nervous that they, they, they couldn't remember. That's rough. And we were dealing, we're dealing with children in the background and they were the, you know, one of the kids was misbehaving and, and, and oh, I'm like, Oh, this guy yeah. can't deliver the lines. And I hired him. I chose him. And, yeah. and it's, and it, that was the worst. Oof. So yeah, that's rough. Yeah. Yeah, working anytime with kids. I have to produce working with kids is tough. Yeah, yeah, and, and 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 when talent can't deliver lines, it's like it's funny because people think like, oh, I'm gonna buy the nicest like buy the nicest gear or rent the nicest thing or whatever for the project, but getting good like talent like people that are actually skilled on camera is huge because it can make or break the video. I've had definitely a lot like that where it's like, this person cannot read a teleprompter to save their <laughs> life, like horrible yeah. and i mean i can't blame them most people have never read a teleprompter in their life like i've done it because Shut i up. make videos and you know sometimes i throw up a teleprompter you've probably done the same thing like so we have a little bit of experience with it but most people haven't ever and it's it is bad it's like cringy and you're just like yeah this video is not gonna work so yeah mm -hmm. man if i can avoid a teleprompter yeah. i would i i try to if i can just like ask them a question and get a natural answer out of them even still that can be a struggle they're like oh let me re-say that let me re-say that but oof, yeah teleprompters can so, be bad if they're no skills so say uh what's up glenn uh i think i talked to brent uh, glenn before yeah he's just uh throw a mad box on the lumix g7 to the yeah that's right <laughs> a get mad box always makes the camera like look more legit right 100 <laughs> percent yeah, that's the that's the secret sauce to any any camera. Even a nice even a nice camera, like uh, the um, the Ursa the Ursa Mini. You throw a matte box on there, and it looks ten times more pro. Even still, it looks better. It makes mm. any camera look more pro. So mm -hmm. you can agree there for sure. And they're useful. Um, let's see. Ann Ann Mall is saying, will you suggest a Lum Lumix GH5 for music videos and commercials in 2021, or is there a better one? I mean. You can make a you can make a music video really on any camera. Whatever camera you own or have access to, you can make a music video. I wouldn't say that the camera makes the video by any means. So yes, that's a great camera for that. And it shoots 10 bit. I think it does 4K 60, so good camera. I can definitely recommend it. I, I personally don't own it or shoot with it, but I've heard a lot of really good things about it. So definitely, Glenn says, what's up, hey. So yeah, I mean, I know we've covered a lot of things and we're 40 minutes deep. There's a couple more things I'd still want to cover with you. Um, we've talked a lot about gear. Everyone loves talking about gear. So what, what are the camera packages that you're working with right now? I think I heard most of them, but what, what's your camera lineup? What do you usually bring on set? Um, how's that looking for you? Yeah, the, right now the, the Ursa mini pro G2, that's what I'm, if I have to choose, uh, I'll bring that one just because if I'm having to record audio internally, I can do it. Mm -hmm. No, no problem. Especially if there's no audio person that's being hired. Uh, I, I like to, you know, I'm not, I don't want to bring out a whole different sound mixer. Yeah. So sometimes I'm doing uh, quick documentaries, interviews. Mm -hmm. So for that, if we're, if we're doing commercials then the, the red Komodo is, it's what, uh, you know, some clients want that, uh, not my favorite footage to work with because you need a beefy computer to take on 6k footage. Yeah. Uh, red. Is, so my computers are okay. Mm -hmm. They can kind of take it on. Sometimes it crashes. So, you know, and then there's other productions where I'm just hired. I show up and the camera's there and then I just have to operate whatever they rented, like the C300 or, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's primarily the, the other camera I work with, the uh, C300 or C200. Yeah, um, super popular cameras. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that makes sense. And that's it's interesting because, like, the red Komodo, of course, I think it's been on a lot of people's list for a long time. I bet a lot of people in the chat would love to pick one up. They're nearly impossible to find. I, like, you can't even order one right now. If they're, like, on back order forever. Oh, really? Yeah, they, they're on back order, like, so bad with uh, with red. Like I, I haven't seen one actually like available like ever actually. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that's mm. a, it's a, it's, it's a camera that I've wanted to get, but it's interesting to hear people talk about like it's workflow and stuff. Like 
after the fact. It's like, oh, it's hard to work with. It's harder to work with on your on your computer. I've heard the same thing from Tommy Calloway. Like he made a whole video about that, and then he like sold off his uh, uh, his red Komodo because it was too much work. Later, it's not a it's not it's not a YouTube camera. It's no. If, if, if you you don't want to use it for YouTube, it's overkill. Mm -hmm. Unless you're like a big YouTuber, like uh, you know, and, and you can Brownlee. afford Mark. Yeah, yeah. And then you can you can afford a twenty thousand dollar computer, and yeah. it'll eat through red footage like that. Yeah. But if you're not that, then it's not for you. It, it, that's for like commercials, I would say, or people that that have really nice, you know, yeah. editing base computers and yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it's definitely yeah, like for for YouTube, I would say Blackmagic Pocket 4K is the way to go. Yeah, it's a great camera. <laughs> like, oh man, the the I I uh, I was uh, on the A7 III right for the longest time. Yeah. Did you have this camera? Uh, I did not have the A7 III, A7S, A7S II, um, similar, but not. Yeah, I never had the A7 III. Well, well once I saw I compare the footage from the Blackmagic Pocket 4K to. The uh, the my A7 III, a Sony A7 III, it was just like holy crap! Now I understand the difference once you see it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it has a it, you know, and the price is it's insane how cheap it is, right? Absolutely crazy. I I would say oh my god, if you're getting into this and you want like a filmic camera, you're gonna produce commercials, ads, like short films. That's the go-to camera, the Pocket 4K or the 6K, 6K Pro. I think any of those would be like 6K. Absolutely yep. go for any of those. And and, and like editing a black magic footage, so easy. Like it looks so good just with yeah. uh like if you get some of the you know, if you're on DaVinci and you apply the light just like off whatever, it's just like clink converts so beautifully. And that that was my big problem with uh with Sony cameras like the A7S2. It was just it was a lot to work with if you're shooting S log two, S log three, even with the FS seven. It was just like you gotta know what you're doing in order to get to a good level. Yeah. Uh with the black magic, I just love how you can get to a good color like so fast. Yeah. And it it just looks really good. I I, I you know. Yeah. So I, I mean I definitely agree with that. <laughs> And I, th I think it's probably the same thing with the uh, Ursa Mini G2, like, because it all shoots B mm -hmm. so raw film. So, yeah, yeah, they look beautiful, really easy. So, I definitely agree with that. Um, let's see what, uh, what's going on in the chat. Pro Media GFX says, How do you feel about the red, the red line? I'm pretty sure you're saying the red Scarlet X. I haven't used it. I couldn't say. Mm, me neither. Um, Jeremy is saying he's used the red Komodo in a workshop. It's cool. Uh, Glenn Reed still rocking his Lumix S1 and he loves it. Just upgraded the 5.9K ProRes Raw and B-Raw. Yeah, that's sick, dude. Um, I know we've actually talked about that before. Lumix S1 looks really cool, full frame. I know it can do 6K you know, output over HDMI to the Ninja V. Wow. So that's cool. Wow. And, it, and they added B-Raw. Um, so that's pretty cool. I mean, right. Yeah. No way. That's yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's only like B raw is like more open sourcey now. Like, so it's not just on black wow. magic. They've got it on some of the Lumix and then they have it on the Nikon Z's a couple of the Nikon Z's have B raw. Oh. So yeah, it's kind of cool. They're adding it to more cameras. Oh. It's a good, good codec. So, um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Jeremy says, what's your ambition for the future? I know it's a cliche question. Where do you want to be in 10 years? Where do you want to be in 10 years, Marcos? <laughs> what's your, uh, what's your I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't think that far ahead. And, and uh, you know, I, but I, I do want to, like, I know that I, I love filmmaking. I just want to DP. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I want to do commercials. Like, I know most people have uh, ambitions of doing feature films. Mm-hmm. I don't like, I know I want to do uh, just commercials or, or, or even, uh, documentaries like, cause documentaries are like my favorite. Yeah. Uh, if I can get paid to do documentaries and a subject I really like, then I'm all in. Right. And, uh, but I also like the, the aesthetics of, of commercials of the, the amount of finesse that goes into that, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. I think that's cool. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I I love doing commercials as well, but I like I want to do higher end commercials, but I wouldn't say it's my end end game. 
I like I do want to do movies and television someday um, still. But even if I even if I only ever just like, OK, I'm making high end commercials like, I don't know, Geico or Coca-Cola or whatever, like that would be enough. Like I would feel pretty good about myself doing that. So I think that's really cool. And documentaries, too, like you have the cameras, you could, you could make a documentary. You could come up with a little story or idea and you could just start working. On I, I don't want, I, I just want to shoot it. Oh, I don't okay. want to, you don't plan. want to produce it. <laughs> I don't That's want, right. I don't want to produce. That's right. I don't want to like, like babysit the whole project edit. Yeah. It just would stress me out. Uh, I, I don't think I could do it. I need to partner up with somebody who can take on. Yeah. Who? Yeah. Yeah. How, do you, do you, do you see yourself like, uh, just, being a DP or do you want to take on other roles? Uh, I mean, being a DP, I think would definitely be the goal. Uh, like that'd be nice. Unfortunately right now, like with what I'm doing, like I do a lot of the roles. I, you know, usually edit the projects that I work on. Um, like that I shoot, I usually end up editing them or taking a part in the editing and someone else finishes it with graphics or that sort of thing, color grading. Um, but yeah, just being a sole DP would be, would be the best for sure. Like in my opinion, mm -hmm. so I don't have to do the, do everything else. You know, we wear a lot of hats. Like as a freelancer, you know, this like every hat and that's stressful. So it's so nice to just be like a cog in the greater machine and just like do your role and everyone else does their role. And it's, yeah, it's way nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that's, that's one of the things that, uh, I, I was, uh, working on a video today about that, you know, the, like the like mistakes I've done over the years. And yeah. a lot of it comes from wearing too many hats, you know, because when you're like a one person video team, yeah. you have to set up the audio, fix up the room, uh, you know, the whatever, block out the, the windows and set up the lighting, the cameras. Oh, you, they want two cameras and you're monitor, monitoring audio. And then you come back and you realize you made mistakes and that's because you were trying to do all these things and I always I always come back with uh, unhappy with what I did like there was little mistake either you know so I, those things I think uh, for me it, it became very unsatisfying having to do everything myself because there's a lot of mistakes that I did I and I noticed right yeah and w when you have a crew people you're working with Everybody can do their role, you know, and, and you can massage your just your 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 part of the the video, uh, the your part of, of the project or whatever, the camera and just finesse that to the, you know, the ultimate and the the, you know, you can and somebody will handle the audio and they'll do that really well. Right. Yeah. And and so that, that that's what I see, too. That, that's why I want to work in commercials, because. It's a lot of finessing that happens and, and you're working with professionals who are the best at what they do. And I, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I enjoy that part. Yeah. I think that's really cool. I definitely agree. It's, it's nice to just be able to focus on like making a beautiful image, beautiful lighting, great camera angles, whatever, whatever it is, getting the nice shots and just focusing in on your job. And it makes everyone, if everyone focuses on, on their own job, like it makes the whole product, the end product so much better. So mm -hmm. definitely agree. Um, Scott Slasher says commercials are the best. Yeah. So um, let's see. I want to take a couple more minutes with you and talk quickly about, um, I'm just looking at my notes here. So how do you typically charge, you know, when it comes down to that? Or do you charge hourly? Is it a day rate? You know, you come out, hey, or is it by project? And, you know, how do you determine what the budget is? Or did the client usually tell you what their budget is? How does that work for you? I know it's different for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, great question. I mean, it depends, right, on the type of client. Sometimes I'm just hit up by production companies. Hey, what's your day rate? And mm. We're going to provide all the cameras. So I just give them my day rate. This is what I charge just for me to show up. Yeah. No gear. Now, that's also part of the reason I, I moved on to the bigger camera bodies like the Komodo or the Ursa G2. It's easier to charge a rental fee for that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you now we're dealing with an expensive camera and, and so it's more justified, right, to charge a rental fee. Yeah. Uh, it's easier to get that. Um, so yeah, it's myself. Oh, you want me to show up with the camera? 
another light item mm -hmm. for my, my camera package. And usually I charge about what 3.5% is the typical going rate. Maybe a little bit more if with, you know, all the bells and whistles that I'm adding onto the camera. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And so, oh, and if they need like, like, again, I said, uh, do you, do you need a grip, uh, grip truck with all the C stands and, and all that? Yeah. That's a, that's a line item. Uh, oh, you want me to run audio? That's another line item yeah. <laughs> because I have pretty nice audio gear as well. Um, so, and, and then sometimes it's just, uh, it depends how much they're asking for. You know, I, I think at the beginning I was giving everything away for free. Yeah. It's like, this is my rate and I'll do everything. I'll bring the drone. I'll bring a slider. I'll bring everything. Yep. And it's just one rate uh, now. Yeah. I, I break it apart so they know. Okay, you you want a Dana because I have a Dana dolly as well. Nice. Oh, you you want because the big cameras require just bigger stuff. And so if you're if they're asking for a lot of stuff, then with that I need a a camera assistant or uh, or something. You know, uh, someone I, now I can't work alone because you're asking for you know you your your expectations are much higher. You you're asking for all this gear, so I need maybe a focus puller or whatever it might be. And sometimes I provide that uh, in my budgets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, th that, that's when uh, they know exactly what they want. They just want me to show up and, and shoot an interview or whatever or and a couple B-rolls. I, I, I can give them line items. But if I'm working directly with the client, it's not a, necessarily a production company or an agency. They're looking for the whole video. Then that's when I we start talking about what's your budget, right? Yeah. And and uh, you know I I think I've I've learned this online from like the that that uh, there's a YouTube channel called The Future without the E. Hmm. I learned a lot about negotiating through the uh, you know through the things they teach there, and and also like other sources you know like just having that conversation, getting comfortable with asking the uh, the client. Well, what are you looking to, you, you know, what are you looking to spend and what is your budget, right? Because, uh, you know, the 30 second video might be 30 seconds, but it could cost you a hundred thousand yeah. dollars or it can cost you five thousand yeah. dollars. So you, you tell me what kind of, you know, show me examples of things you've seen and I'll tell you approximately what a video like that would cost. Yeah to produce. Right. And so I always try to get nowadays, I just try to get their budget you know, and if, and, and if they're not willing to tell me a number, then that's when I try to set a high price anchor or saying, well, you know, the last videos we did. And if you look at my website, that video right there cost $10,000 or 5,000, whatever, yeah. or, or $2,000. And just so they know what things cost in, and, and, and it's better like <laughs> set a high price anchor. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, that way they, they normalize, they, they, it's, it's easier for them to normalize the numbers because it is not cheap. What we do, the, the amount of gear we own doesn't pay for itself. No. You know, it, it's, if you own all this stuff, it might break, you, you need to insure it, all this stuff, you have to account for all of that. So there's definitely gotta be, uh, a, you know, you, you gotta know your numbers, right? Mm -hmm. because eventually you will have to replace all this stuff that we own. Um, so that's in a nutshell how I approach it. <laughs> yeah, no, that was, that was great. Thank you. That was really detailed too. Like good breakdown of how you approach it. I think uh, you're approaching it the right way. I think I was the same way starting out that it was like, Hey, uh, yeah, I'll show up. And like, of course I'm bringing all my gear. Right. Cause you, you don't know. <laughs> you're just like, yeah, I'll bring all the junk that I have. I want my gimbal. I want my drone, like all this stuff. <laughs> And then you realize later, like, wait, I should be charging for all this. Like, if they didn't ask for mm -hmm. a drone, like, they don't get a drone. If they didn't ask for the big Dana dolly or a nice slider, like, they don't get it. Um, mm. And and yeah, it makes it makes it so much more justifiable to like have your rates and your bigger rates to be like, yep, this is what it costs, and line item, line item. And then when you put it all out like that on a, an estimate or a bid, and it's too high, and they're like, ah, oh, this is too high. We can't afford you or whatever. You could say, okay, that's fine, but. Um, like 
I, I can take off the gim the gimbal or the drone or the Dana Dolly mm-hmm. or whatever it is. Or like, hey, I won't bring my red, but I can bring my pocket 4K and you know, like yeah. start fluctuating the budget for them. But you start high. You're like, here's what I have to offer. Here's the best I have to offer. But if you can't afford it, let me start like working with you you know, on what you can offer. And then they feel like they got a deal. Like, okay, he usually charges a lot, but he gave us a cool deal because he got rid of this or that or whatever. And it kind of works in your favor. So. Right, right. I I think that's a really good approach. Just, just, well, what's your budget? Now that you've been transparent with giving them numbers and it's too high, well, tell me what your budget is now. Yeah. You know, what do you want to spend? Like now finally tell me. I know you had a number in mind. Yep, and they typically do. They typically do. Once you like hit that, they're like, oh, yeah, I was really thinking like a thousand bucks and you're like, yeah, that's not going to work. Like for that, I'll show up with, uh, you know, I don't even know my iPhone, you know, whatever it is, but it's like, yeah, no, that's not gonna, that's not gonna fly for like, I'm a pro and I have like, like my, you know, you could have one piece of gear that costs that much lenses that cost twice that, you know? So it's just like people don't understand the real value of of this kind of work. Right. And, and it's good for anyone who's watching this to right now go to like borrowlenses.com or whatever rental house company and see how much things cost to rent out. Like how much does it cost to rent out a, I don't know, a red or a nice stain of dolly slider. And that, that's where you can see that if you didn't own that stuff and they want a, a nice lighter shot, with a specific camera, they're gonna have to go to a rental house company and they're gonna have to pay that money, right? So why should you not charge, you know, you have to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's what makes part of like investing in this kind of gear worth it is the fact that you can charge for it yourself later. So you're like, hey, I don't have to rent it every time, but actually I can charge a higher rate and it's gonna pay itself off and I'm more marketable. Like you, you invest in all these nice cameras that you're like, hey, now people wanna hire me more because they know I'm gonna come with the red name or the Ursa or whatever. They know you're gonna come with the Sony FS7, you know, when you had that. So I think it's a really cool mm-hmm. approach. And the, the gear truck, like that's huge. Be like, yeah, I got a whole grip truck that I can bring all this stuff that you need. Oh, yeah, I was having this discussion with a friend. Uh, I got hired to shoot and the client, well, I, I got hired to shoot for this client through an agency of, of a production company mm-hmm. and, and they helped me out and, and they were putting stuff in my van. It's like, oh, it's a nice van. And so in their minds, they're like, oh, this guy can handle bigger projects. And I'm not just a videographer because I was doing videography work for them. Yeah. But they trusted me to do uh, a corporate kind of commercial type of stuff. That's cool. Because again, the 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 i guess they saw that i have a in my i think that's what happened right they saw that i have a whole van with all this stuff and and uh you know the so i guess it gave me that aura of like oh this guy know he can handle bigger projects and so sometimes you just want to give out those signals to the world you know that's that's why you end up i ended up doing that you know buying those cameras even though uh, buddies were like, that's stupid. Why'd you buy the, that camera when you can buy this other one that's cheaper? And like, I know it's just, <laughs> I'm buying it cause I'm trying to impress people here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it gets, it lands you the job though. You know, that's a huge part. Yeah. Of it. It and it landed job. me, it landed exactly landed me some jobs. And, and, and so I know that that was a real investment landing those jobs. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, let's see. What's up, Domino Stories? Welcome back, man. Um, Barnell, what's up? Yeah, Domino Stories, he's saying, what about the red Komodo? Yeah, man, we were talking about that just a couple minutes ago. Marcos has oh. it, and he's been uh, been loving it, getting a lot of good shoots with it, it sounds like. So, good, good, seems like a good camera. Maybe someday I'll buy one. I don't know. I don't know. You can't even find him right now, so we'll see. Ugh. <laughs> I'm always itching, and then I hear people using it, and I'm like, dang it, man. Don't make me buy that camera. My wife's going to kill me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just bought the uh, I just bought the Sony FX3. So that's actually what I'm shooting on right now, the Sony FX3. I've been liking it so far. Yeah. You know, it's a little like kind of like the one step up from the A7S3. I like it because it's got the dual XLR input, so I can like go out do interviews and that sort of thing and just plug right oh, in. Oh, so no way. Yeah, is that camera so small? I just saw it at the, you know, this DP guy was using it, and and it's, nice. it's like. Tiny. Oh, it has XLRs. Oh, that's, yeah. That's so great. the top handle. So when you put the top oh, handle on, could... it has the XLRs mm. that you get like with a lot of like the 
the Sony FS5s, the Canons, a lot of them where the XLR inputs are on the top handle. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you throw that cool. on top, you can take it off and run it on a gimbal and have that small package, but then you can throw that on and do your interviews with full XLRs in. So I've been happy with it and I've, it's been a while since I've shot full frame. So it's kind of nice to be back on it and like get more of that shallow depth of field and like low light performance. So Wow. Oh, I don't know, man. Yeah. So that's what I'm rocking. It never, it never ends. Dude, it never <laughs> ends. Yeah. So FX3 <laughs> and then the A6600. It's kind of been like my main like YouTube camera because it's so easy to shoot with and the autofocus is so mm. good. Uh, I don't shoot client stuff on it. And then the Pocket 6K, which I love the look of, like you were saying, still have that. Yeah. The 6K Pro I just got from Blackmagic. I'm just doing a review on. Um, but it's nice. I don't know. I might end up picking one up and like switch out the 6K. I don't know. And then uh, the Fujifilm X-T4. And that's that's kind of like my hybrid, like good photography camera, but also like decent for video. So uh, I don't know. Might sell them all and just get a red. Who knows? No one knows. <laughs> but yeah, man, it's yeah, it's crazy. I think I think that's a cool, cool investment, though. Um, I don't know. They're getting my mind thinking like, hmm, yeah hire me because i have a red well but, you know also the i think i i got it uh once i why uh, once i knew enough people that shot with those cameras yeah yeah and so and then i kind of let them know i had it <laughs> yeah. because they well dps are shooting commercials right and, and so i i I've also seen online people make videos about why they sold the red after three months or six months. Yeah. And, and cause they expected that you own it. Now all the work's going to flood to you or somehow, mm -hmm. I think it's much more about the connections you have, you know, and have been in the right network. And, and I think I knew some people that, that were preferring to shoot on red yeah. and that were looking to that for that. And so that's how I got my first uh, jobs through those people that I already knew. That makes sense. So, you know, the, I think that the, the, that's also important. You know, the, that's an important element of where, where it makes it made. I, I, that's how I rationalize the investment. Yeah. And that's how I've been able to get a couple rentals from that, too, you know, and, and get hired for those jobs. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. You 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 knew going into it that it was going to pay off, and that it was going to be the right the right thing because people were looking for it in your network. So, yeah, 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 exactly. That's cool. Um, um, yeah, I think um, you know Domino Stories asked opinion on DaVinci Resolve seventeen. I don't really use DaVinci personally, like here and there when I need to edit B raw, um, but otherwise. I don't know. I've seen Marcos. You made a video on this too, but like I transcode my B raw to Final yeah. Cut, and like to ProRes, and then yeah. edit ProRes. I don't know. Do you, are are you doing that, or or do you edit in Resolve? What are you doing mostly when you do shoot B raw? Uh, I'm like you. I I, you know, if I'm shooting YouTube videos with the Black Magic, I shoot ProRes mm -hmm. because I don't want to transcode if I don't have to. Yeah. But sometimes I've ended up shooting B raw and I have to transcode in so I do it, uh, like we have videos about that, right? How to transcode in final cut. I, I love final yeah, cut. Me too. I, I, you can't move me. It's going to be really hard to move me away from final yeah. cut because I just know it so well. It's so easy. It never, it never, uh, almost never, uh, crashes on yep. me or fails to export yeah. where premiere, you know, not to offend anyone. I, I know that people like to get very emotional over their cameras and the editing program, yep. but <laughs> Premiere to me crashes a lot, you know, and sometimes or like DaVinci and Premiere, you have to change the settings on your computer. So some computers where you have to tweak. Otherwise, when you export, it comes out desaturated. Mm, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that issue before. Yeah, you, you it, the, the colors come out desaturated. So uh, that's why I've never I could never switch to. Uh, well, I fixed it in DaVinci. It's just I haven't been able to fully switch because I just li like Final Cut so much. Yeah. So. I think I'm on the same page as you. I've been using it for so yeah. long and I can do it so fast and it works so well that like it's hard for me to switch. Like I've used Premiere a little bit and Resolve probably more. But yeah, it's going to be a long time before I make, make a switch like that. 
So I know it's always a fun battle. I battle with the guys at work. A lot of them use Premiere, and we just like always battle. Even today, oh. making fun of each other. Oh, Final Cut sucks. Like that's for being. <laughs> so I'm like, come on, dude. I get it so fast and so well out of it. Oh, Premiere crashed. Oh, you lost your project. Hmm. Like <laughs> just. It's yeah. Funny to hear people kind of battle it out over it. Um, yeah. Hey, Domino. I'm saying hi. Um, fix the color shift. Use sRGB for DaVinci to fix the color shift. Yeah, yeah. At, at a glance, I think I, that that's what I did. I did. I changed some settings on DaVinci. Um, it, it, but it's funny how it's only on my iMac. It has a problem upon export. It, the colors come out desaturated. When I edit on my uh, new M1. A MacBook Pro, the 13 inch. Nice. Doesn't have that. It doesn't have the same issue. Nice. But I don't like to edit in my laptop. I want to edit in my big iMac. Yeah. So the bigger yeah. screen. So. so that's that's funny. So we both are rocking the M1s now. How how's that been working out for you? I know it's been a debate for a lot of people. Do you think you can use the M1 for professional video editing, production, that sort of thing? What do you think? And have you have you edited red? or, um, mm -hmm. you know, your 4K B-Raw, that sort of stuff on it. Like, um, how's that been? I, I haven't really used the the MacBook Pro, the the M1 to edit footage. Okay. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't really done it. Just, I don't like the small screen yeah. and just, uh, I, I had to buy it because my old, I, the old MacBook Pro, the, is a 2014, I believe, mm. was in, updating a uh, zoom yeah and so when the clients asked for a live zoom feed <laughs> yeah i couldn't give it no, to them so that's the only reason yeah. I, yeah i wouldn't update the zoom and so i that's why i got it and and but i i didn't really buy it for editing but uh okay you know the, i tried it and, 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 and it was able to take it take uh footage with no problem like like uh the black magic yeah. No problem. Um, I think I did. Ex I ended up exporting through the iMac. No, through my MacBook Pro M1. Uh, when I was uh, working on this, this, uh, this, this video project, where the my iMac 2017 was crashing, and so the iMac was able to mm. export. I, I think that's what happened. I, that's, uh, so yeah. yeah. I mean, for editing, it's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It makes makes sense. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll see what happens there. I'm excited to see what Apple does with, with uh, their future chips and everything like that, especially for us Final Cut editors, man. I, I've been I've been full M1 for like three months now on the um, mm. iMac uh, M1. So it's the 24-inch. It's not as big as the 27-inch that I'm used to, but I have two displays now so it's, I can spread out, and it's been working good. I'm, I think it's, I think it's fine. I, I'm I hope uh, they make them even faster in the future, more RAM. So, yeah, man, I think mm -hmm. uh, I think we're on. Where are we at? We're we're in deep. We're an hour and ten minutes in. So, yeah, dude, I wow. just want to. I, I know. The went by yeah, fast. Yeah, dude, it goes right? quick. I mean, yeah. obviously, we could chat forever, but I don't want to take take all your night. And uh, you know, thank you so much for coming on, hanging out with us tonight, talking about doing video production full time, freelance work. You know what it's like to do your. Uh, gear rentals, your pricing, everything like that. Hopefully it's been helpful to everyone down in the chat. Um, yeah, it's always fun to hang out with you, talk with you, see see what's going on on the uh, West Coast and how, how work is going. So really appreciate it, man. All right. Well, I appreciate, appreciate you for having me. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do this sometime again. And I don't know when, but. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Definitely, man. All hey, right. We'll stay, stay on the call for a sec. I'm going to end the, the live stream and then. Uh, It'll be, uh, okay. everyone have a good night. Thanks again for joining. And uh, we'll talk yep. to you later.